Okay. Or maybe I'll read and also click people in at the at the same time here. Uh, actually, can I make Katie a co-host? Uh, I can only make host, it looks like, instead of co-host. So I'm just going to start uh, here. So hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Robert Driver. I'm the chair of the Graduate Student Advisory Committee uh, at SSE. Uh, and I wanted to welcome you to the uh, Greg seminar series. So uh, normally we'll just jump straight into the speaker without uh, further ado. Uh, but because of the first week, uh, I wanted to introduce the seminar series a little bit. So uh, as a lot of you, I'm sure most of you know, uh, each year the SSE offers two graduate research excellence grants. These are called the Gregs. Uh, one of which is the R.C. Lewontin Award for early PhD students. The other is the Rosemary Grant Award uh, for advanced PhD candidates. Uh, and I don't have the exact numbers, uh, but each year uh, these awards receive maybe upwards of 120 to 150 applications, uh, making these highly competitive, uh, even compared to other society-based uh, small research grants. So I want to uh, really acknowledge the substantial amount of effort that goes into writing a successful proposal. Uh, winners have to be able to describe the project and how it advances the field of evolutionary biology while still remaining feasible as part of a graduate uh, dissertation. So uh, the inaugural Greg seminar series here, uh, we, here we want to celebrate the challenging and innovative work of Greg recipients. And we're sharing this work uh, to the public uh, for the first time where normally you would just write the uh, uh, proposal and then go about your research. Um, so great. So this seminar series, a description of it is that Greg recipients will broadcast their work as part of a seminar style talk. And the series will run on Mondays at noon for nine weeks, starting today, October 2nd, all the way through December 4th. And each week we'll showcase the research and the research plans of a 2023 R.C. Lewontin Award winner. And I want to thank everyone for being here on our first week and thank the uh, SSC Council and the Graduate Student Advisory Committee for support and input, and especially thank Akshat Mall, this week's speaker. Before we turn our attention to Akshat's research, one last thing I want to mention uh, to please put your microphones on mute. If you have any questions, there will be time for a Q&A session at the end of Akshat's talk, uh, and you can participate uh, by unmuting yourself then. Uh, or by typing anytime uh, in the chat box, and we can address all the questions that accumulate over the hour uh, at the end. Um, and I'd like to remind everyone this is an SSE-sponsored event and that all participants are required to follow the SSE Code of Conduct, and I will post the Code of Conduct link in the chat. And uh, also, please be aware that we're recording this talk. So, uh, now... Uh, Akshat Mall is currently a PhD candidate in Dr. Christopher Mark's lab at the University of Idaho. And uh, Akshat has a unique background uh, for the evolutionary biology field uh, because he received his Bachelor of Technology in Chemical Engineering, um, which is great, um, from the Indian Institute of Technology in Bombay and Mumbai, India. And he completed an undergraduate thesis under Dr. Supreet uh, Saini, where he worked on theoretical models of bacterial community assembly. And from his time as an undergraduate, he has a paper in Frontiers of Microbiology, and I believe it's his undergraduate thesis that is published in Frontiers in Ecology and Evolution uh, as a first author paper. And currently at the University of Idaho, Akshat has been working on understanding the physiological basis and evolutionary consequences of heterogeneity and tolerance to formaldehyde in methyl methylobacterium extorquins, which I'm sure we'll hear about. Uh, we are excited to hear about his research today at the Greg Seminar Series, and his talk is entitled Multi-Generational Multi Epigenetic Inheritance of Rare Phenotypes Can Speed Adaptation in Stressful Environments. So thank you so much, Akshat. I will post the uh, code of conduct into the chat and I'll let Akshat take it away. Akshat, you are muted. Thank okay. you. Okay, no problem. Uh, 
Uh, thank you for the intro and thank you everyone for joining today. So, so today I'll be talking about epigenetic inheritance and how that can shape evolutionary dynamics in bacterial populations. Uh, yeah. So firstly, a uh, big thank you to everyone in the Mark Sudeku lab at the University of Idaho for help with this research and to our funding sources. So before we go into epigenetic inheritance, I would like to describe what we know about bacterial evolution and how we study bacterial evolution. So I'll use the most well-known example of bacterial evolution out there, Rich Rensky's E. coli long-term evolution experiment. So the evolution experiment goes as follows. You start with a single colony and you grow it up in your environment of interest, in this case, minimal glucose media. You choose a small fraction of cells and transfer that into fresh media every 24 hours, during which they double approximately seven times. And you keep doing so again and again and for hundreds of thousands of generations and you end up selecting for the fastest growers. So this has been going on for almost 35 years now. And what do people see? So if you track fitness of the evolved populations, so fitness corresponds to growth rate with respect to the ancestor and over 50,000 generations, we see something like this. The fitness keeps in increases and keeps increasing with time and it has been going on for almost 80,000 generations now. So how do populations always keep evolving? So evolution of this fashion is contingent on a supply of beneficial mutations. So what happens is you start with your ancestral population in gray here, a beneficial mutant corps up in blue. And since it's more fit, it begins to take over the population. And as it takes over, the mean population fitness increases and more mutants keep coming up. And as they keep taking over, the population fitness keeps on increasing. So when does evolution of this sort fail? What are the pitfalls associated with evolution? Evolution is contingent on the supply of beneficial mutations. So we can talk about beneficial mutation supply as population size times the beneficial mutation rate. And at times, neither of those can be sufficient and the populations may suffer from a lack of available beneficial mutations. This can happen in a couple of scenarios. A, when the population sizes are very small, so there aren't any beneficial mutations lying around as the environment changes, or if the population face a lethal stress and the number of individuals are dying faster than they can replicate. And also when the targets accessible to improve fitness in the environment are very rare and are hard to access. Typically in those situations, beneficial mutation rates are on the order of 10 to negative eight, which means once in every 10 billion cell divisions, you get a beneficial mutation. So what happens if your mutation supply is inefficient, is insufficient? In scenarios like this, when faced with a lethal stress, populations can go extinct. So an example of this comes from Ben Kerr's lab. So consider a bacterial population, which is being evolved on rifampicin. And you have three scenarios here. In the first scenario, a population is taken and exposed to the concentration of rifampicin, which is of interest, 100 microgram per mils here. And you are reliant on a pre-existing resistant mutant to be able to survive. In the other two scenarios, the population reaches the same concentration, but it goes through a much more gradual process, going through a large number of dumplings before it reaches the lethal dose of rifampicin. So the question they ask is, in these three treatments, what's the likelihood of the population surviving? So if you had a few hundred populations going through each treatment, what fraction of those will be able to adapt to rifampicin? And what they see is something like this. When directly exposed to rifampicin, most, almost none of the populations were able to make it through and went extinct because they didn't have any beneficial mutations lying around. So the question we are interested in is, in such scenarios when populations are faced with strong selective pressures and they don't have mutations available, can they do something else to improve the likelihood of survival? Which brings us to our topic for today, epigenetic variation and how it can assist or even hinder adaptation in such scenarios. So how we define epigenetics is 
all non-genetic factors which affect cellular phenotype and which can be inherited across generations. And for epigenetic variation to influence evolution, it needs certain ingredients. The epigenetic variation must translate to phenotypic variation across individual cells. And not just that, the different phenotypes should have different fitnesses in a certain environment. And those alternate phenotypes should be inherited across all environments. So before going into my system, I'll talk about, can we get these three factors from non-genetic sources alone? So non-genetic differences can lead to phenotypic variation in a couple of ways. First, I'll talk about noise in gene expression. So here you have an isogenic population that is all cells are genetically identical, but just due to noise, no two cells can ever be exactly the same. That is every protein, every molecule in the cell won't be in the exact same concentration between any two individuals due to just stochasticity. And given the stochasticity, you can get very discrete phenotypes of this sort from continuous variation. So this can happen in the following fashion. You have a distribution of protein concentrations across a population from because of stochasticity. But if the protein is a transcription factor which regulates its own expression, it can lead to a positive feedback loop of this sort that above a certain threshold, the gene is expressed and below a certain threshold, the gene is not, leading to discrete phenotypes of this sort. This forms alternate st steady states in a sort that if the protein concentration exceeds that threshold, you fall into a valley and the gene is on and you stay on. And alternately, if it's not, you stay off. The best example of this comes from the lac operon in E. coli. So here we have a population of genetically identical cells in the same environment. And the color here represents whether the, whether the lac system is switched on or switched off. So just due to noise in gene expression and the associated positive feedback in the lac operon, we see some of the cells are on, indicated by green, while some, while some cells are off and they're white. Another source of phenotypic variation in genetically identical cells in identical environments is DNA methylation. So this example here comes from Salmonella. So one of the genes for Salmonella virulence is STD, and it has motifs which can be methylated. Typically, these motifs are methylated, and the gene is in an off state and can't be expressed. But if, for instance, the motifs are demethylated, the transcription factor for the gene can bind to the to the promoter region and the gene is now expressed and the gene is on. And this is important because this gene dictates whether the salmonella expresses the type 3 secretion system or expresses fimbria. So that is whether it's virulent or not. Typically, methylation switching rates between a gene being methylated or demethylated are of the, are of the orders of 10 to the negative 3 or 10 to the negative 4. So they are much more frequent and accessible than beneficial mutations as a way of alternating between phenotypes. Differences in DNA methylation of this sort can also be involved in a positive feedback loop and be inherited. So you have a methylated piece of DNA. The mere fact that it is methylated inhibits a DNA binding protein like a repressor from binding to the piece of DNA. And the piece of DNA can now when it divides, again be accessed by the methylase and remain methylated. Alternately, if the DNA sequence is bound by a repressor, the DNA methylase can't access the DNA region and it can't be methylated again. So they are mutually inhibitive and lead to a positive feedback. So there are a number of ways you can have phenotypic variation arising from non-genetic sources, but do these alternate phenotypes have distinct fitnesses? The most common example of this is bacterial persistence. So imagine a growing bacterial population which is treated with antibiotics. And with time, because of antibiotics, the number of individuals die. So if you track the number of individuals with time, we see a curve like this, a rapid death followed by a much slower death. So the reason behind this is even in a growing isogenic population, all these cells are genetically identical. The population is split into two phenotypes one which is growing and one which is actually dormant. And these rare dormant phenotypes, just from the fact that they are dormant, they die slowly in the presence of antibiotics and they help the population survive much longer than they would in the absence of anti, than if they comprise only these sensitive ones. Thus having different fitnesses. So the question now which we are interested in is, 
you can have non-genetic variation, which can lead to different phenotypes, which can have different fitnesses. Can they be inherited in the long term, even in the absence of selection? So variation can have different degrees of inheritance. In the case of bacterial persistence, there is absolutely no inheritance because when these persistent cells divide, they again transform into sensitives and the phenotype is immediately lost. So you can imagine a scenario where you have a clonal population, which has two sub phenotypes, a sensitive and a tolerant one, when exposed to stress, the sensitive ones die faster, but if when the tolerant ones divide, they lose the phenotype and become sensitive. So the stress were to continue, the population would die. And in the absence of the stress, the population would go back to this original distribution. So evolutionarily, nothing has changed. So not, can't influence evolution. You can have an alternate scenario where phenotypes can be inherited for a few generations by proteum dilution. So what I mean is, if you if the cell adopted a different phenotype when exposed to the environment, and even if the environment goes away, the alternate phenotype can be inherited because the parent cell passes on its proteum to its daughters, to its daughter cells, and the daughter cells, because they had those proteins, still retain the same phenotype. But with time, the proteum gets diluted and the cellular phenotype reverts back to its normal one. An example of this comes from galactose utilization in yeast. So y-axis here is expression of the GAL1 gene, an enzyme responsible for galactose use. And these people are tracking the time it takes for the GAL1 gene to be expressed in the presence of galactose. So the two populations here are both grown on galactose and they spend the last seven generations on glucose. But the pink one spent some time in galactose seven generations ago, while the blue one didn't. And even though, seven, even though it's been seven generations, they still inherited enough to, of the proteome to have a much stronger and faster response to galactose than without. But the case we are most interested in is long-term stable inheritance of epigenetic factors, phenotypes which persist for dozens of generations, even in the absence of selection. This can happen in a couple of ways. This needs positive feedback and can happen by DNA methylation or by stable regulatory circuits. So I'll talk a bit about how this can happen. So we discussed po how positive feedback can be involved in DNA methylation and alternate phenotypes. They can be inherited in this fashion. You have a sequence of DNA which is methylated, and when the cell divides and DNA replicates, the DNA methylases enzymes which methylate particular motifs, find the new strands and methylate it, and you get the same methylation pattern as before. On the other hand, if you have a piece of DNA which is demethylated because a transcription factor is bound to it, upon DNA replication, the same transcription finds the motif before the DNA methylase scan, and the transcription factor being bound prevents the motif from being methylated. And once again, you get the same methylation pattern as before, and this phenotype can thus persist for a long time. In the second scenario, you can have a bistable regulatory circuit. So Suppose you have a gene X, which has a gene product, and that gene product serves as an activator for the same gene. So if you have enough of the gene product, you keep expressing the gene and you stay on. On the other hand, if you don't, you don't express it and you stay off. And such phenotypes can also be inherited for long, for a large number of generations. So we wanted to understand if non-genetic factors alone can have all the ingredients to influence evolution. We needed phenotypic variation, which we saw that they can cause via positive feedback loops and noise in gene expression. They can have vastly different fitnesses and the alternate phenotypes can be inherited even in the absence of selection in this fashion. So given this possibility of epigenetic variation producing alternate phenotypes, which can be inherited across generations in the same environment, brings us to the focus of today's talk. So I'll be talking about three things today. The first one will be some simulations on whether epigenetic inheritance can assist or hinder adaptation. Second, I will describe an experimental system we find where we discover this phenomenon. And thirdly, how we can parse out the dynamics of evolution with epigenetic inheritance playing a key role. So first, the theoretical bit, does epigenetic inheritance aid or hinder adaptation? This work is in collaboration with Jeremy Draghi at Virginia Tech. 
So first I build a conceptual model of how this might play out. How can it aid evolution? So consider for a given genotype, cells can have two phenotypes, sensitive or tolerant to a given environment. What I mean by tolerant is a rare phenotype, which is genetically identical to the sensitive, but can grow in the presence of a stressor. We have an environment which goes like this, a period of time without any stress and a period of time exposed to stress. And the two phenotypes behave in this fashion. The sensitive one, both phenotypes grow in the stress-free environment, while the tolerant one can grow, sensitive one perishes. In the case where we have only one phenotype, the sensitive one, the population dynamics would look something like this. Initial growth followed by death in the presence of the stressor. But if you have the if you have a tolerant phenotype and that can be inherited, we can see something like this. We have a number of lineages initially. When exposed to the stress, the sensitive ones die, but the tolerant ones are able to survive and keep their phenotype and thus aid adaptation. How can it hinder adaptation? So, aside from phenotypic differences, we have genetic differences which can improve growth in the presence of stress. So you can have a beneficial mutant and the ancestral genotype can acquire beneficial mutations at some rate. But typically the rate of transitioning between alternate phenotypes is much higher than the rate at which they acquire beneficial mutations. So we can expect to see something of this shock. Initial adaptation driven by tolerant phenotypes because they are more prevalent and easily accessible. But when beneficial mutations do crop up, they can be outcompeted by the tolerant phenotype since they had already reached a higher frequency and these had not, so they were lost due to drift. So it hindered long-term evolution by preventing fixed section of a beneficial mutant. So how do we model this scenario? So yeah, we have this possibility that you can adapt either epigenetically by transitioning to a tolerant state or genetically by acquiring mutants mutations, and under which scenarios is it helpful or detrimental to long-term evolution. So our model is something as follows. Our environment goes in this fashion, initially a stress-free environment, followed by an intermediate degree of stress, followed by a lethal dose of stress. And we have the following alleles available to us. At time zero, we start with genotype A, which is our wild type. It has two phenotypes. It can be sensitive or tolerant, which can transition between each other at some rates. They could acquire beneficial mutations at some rates, which can acquire, and the beneficial mutant can acquire further beneficial mutations. The fitnesses of our alleles in this environment is as follows. In the stress-free case, everyone is equally fit and can grow very well. In the presence of some degree of stress, the sensitive ones can't, but all the mutants or the tolerant phenotype is able to grow. And in the case of lethal stress, only the double mutant is able to grow, where, whereas everyone else perishes. So given this setting, the question we are interested in is, what is the likelihood of the population being able to make it from the start to the end of the experiment as a function of the degree of inheritance of this tolerant phenotype? So what we are interested in is, you have a tolerant phenotype that can either be perfectly inherited or always lost, as in the case of persisters, whenever it divides, and something in between. And how is the likelihood of the population surviving vary as a function of the degree of inheritance? So we simulate this for a large number of populations multiple times, and we look at mean values. So what we see is something like this. So the dash line indicates what would be our expected likelihood of survival if there were no heterogeneity and you were only reliant on beneficial mutations to take you through. So in this case, it would have been around 50%. But if you give the populations the possibility of having alternate field types, which are more fit in this environment, we see something like this. We see that some imperfect degree of inheritance maximizes your likelihood of survival. So up to around 0.5, it doesn't really matter whether you have heterogeneity or not. Between some interval, it is incredibly helpful to have heterogeneity and it to be inherited, but perfect inheritance 
is bad and you do much worse than just the no heterogeneity case, which is slightly perplexing. So why does this happen? So we'll focus on individual allele dynamics for these two cases here, the one where it's much better than the no heterogeneity case, and this case where it's much worse than the no heterogeneity case. So for the red dot, what we see is this. So the individual lines represent the number of individuals for each of these genotypes. So the light blue corresponds to the number of individuals of sensitive, yellow, tolerant, cyan, mutant one, dark blue, mutant two. So initially in the stress free environment, there is some stable coexistence of the sensitive and tolerant phenotype based on how frequently they switch between each other. When exposed to the stress, the tolerant one is more fit and begins to take over the population. At some point, a uh, beneficial mutant arises on the tolerant background and it takes over and a double mutant arises before the environment gets worse. And that allows the population to persist towards to the end of the experiment. What happens in the green case where it's much worse than expected than the null expectation? We see something like this. So in this stress-free case, same as before, there is some coexistence of the sensitive and tolerant phenotype. But on exposure to stress, the tolerant phenotype is extremely fit because of its extremely stable inheritance, and it now outcompetes, and it and the beneficial mutant has has a much harder time taking over the population, and it is much slower. And the fact that it's much slower and it can't get fixed means that the double mutant can never crop up. And by competing with the first mutant and preventing the double mutant from coming up, the population is not able to make it through to the end of the experiment. So coming back to our original question, where we thought epigenetic inheritance can be especially critical when mutation supply is limited. So what we do next is we decrease mutation supply. We do this by decreasing the population size tenfold from 10 million to a million. And we ask, how does this result change? Do we see that the role of epigenetic inheritance becomes stronger, weaker, stays the same? We see that it becomes much stronger. With low mutation supplies, the likelihood of just genetic solutions taking the population through is very low. Dash line here, it was 0.5 earlier. And your only way of making it through is via some degree of heritable epigenetic variation. Uh, but still, imperfect inheritance is critical rather than perfect inheritance. But it's, it is now the only route to long-term survival and nothing else works. So just to recap these simulations, we found a couple of things. A, uh, epigenetic inheritance can be good if it is imperfect and you can frequently transition between your alternate phenotypes. Second, it is extremely critical and it is your only route to survival when mutation supply is low. So now I'll talk about the experimental system we use to study this phenomenon. So what we are looking for in a model bacteria or a model stressor is a couple of things. One, an instance of heritable epigenetic variation, which is inherited for a number of generations with or without selection. And second, a fitness difference between the alternate phenotypes produced by the epigenetic differences. So our model system is methylobacterium extorquins in the face of formaldehyde stress. So methylobacterium is a member of the plant microbiome and a very dominant member. So if we take a leaf of a plant and we stamp it on an agar pad, we get methylobacterium pink colonies of this sort. It's a methylotroph, which means it grows on one carbon compounds like methanol, as well as some multi-carbon compounds like succinate. For this work, we'll mostly be focused on growth on methanol or succinate as carbon sources. So where does formaldehyde stress come into the picture? When methylobacterium grows on one carbon compounds like methanol, it involves producing tox formaldehyde as an intermediate, and formaldehyde, as many of you might know, is incredibly toxic. So a lot of work done in this section, a lot of work in this section was done by Jessica Lee and Shia Vaz. So one of the results they found is 
If you take methylobacterium populations and you expose them to formaldehyde and you track number of viable cells with time, they die very rapidly. So you see decreasing viability with time. So formaldehyde is toxic if it is present externally outside there in their external environment. So how do they deal with the formaldehyde? So the first thing the lab did, this was done by Depti and Janelle. They evolved populations on formaldehyde for 150 generations and wanted to know how can they adapt to formaldehyde. So they discovered a gene named EFGA and losing function of that gene enabled growth on high levels of formaldehyde. And they discovered that the gene product of EFGA is a formaldehyde sensor, which inhibits translation upon sensing formaldehyde. So there exist genetic solutions to deal with formaldehyde if it is around. So what happens if you try to grow populations on high levels of formaldehyde? So here you have optical density with time. Optical density indicate is a proxy for the number of cells with time. So if you grow on methanol without any formaldehyde, you see nice, clean exponential growth rapid growth within 24 hours. But you have four millimoles formaldehyde around in the environment. You see a very long lag followed by exponential growth with almost the same rate. So given we knew that there are genetic solutions to formaldehyde, the first most obvious explanation is there's a small pop subpopulation of the cells which grows in the presence of formaldehyde and because they are genetically different and they were able to allow the population to survive. So we sequenced both of these populations and we found that they were genetically identical. So these, this population which took a long time to grow and comprised of only a small subpopulation which was able to grow, it was genetically identical to the ancestor. So not a mutant. We also did RNA-seq on these two populations and we found that they had a slightly different transcriptome. Six operons were differentially expressed, but critically none of these operons which were differentially expressed were involved in formerly had metabolism, one carbon metabolism, that is metabolism which requires going through formaldehyde as an intermediate, so which was surprising. So which brings us to the question, if they are genetically identical and they behave differently, is this due to phenotypic heterogeneity alone? That is, do cells behave differently even though in the same environment, even if they are genetically identical? So to test that, we did this experiment. We take a clonal population and we played them out on different concentrations of formaldehyde. So zero millimoles, two millimoles, four, six millimoles, and so on. So if the population is homogeneous and all individuals in the population behave identically, we would expect to see something like this. There would be some inhibitory concentration of formaldehyde beyond which growth would not be possible. Below that concentration, all of these cells would grow and we would see the same number of viable cells on each plate. Above that concentration in this hypothetical figure, somewhere between two and three, none of these cells would grow. What we see was something different. We saw a large continuous variation in the population's ability to deal with formaldehyde. So in the case of no formaldehyde, stress-free environment, that provides an estimate of the number of viable cells in the population. Increasing formaldehyde, we see that the number of viable cells decreases. For two minimal here, it's like one in 100, one in 1,000, one in 10,000, and so on. So only a small fraction of cells were able to tolerate increasing concentration of formaldehyde. But they were genetically identical. So heterogeneity from epigenetic factors. Another result discovered by Jessica was this. Your environment, so, Another thing we are interested in, since growth on methanol requires using formaldehyde as an intermediate, is this heterogeneity just due to difference in methanol ox formaldehyde oxidation capacities? So to test that, we have a different experiment. We wanted to check if your environmental history impacts your tolerance to formaldehyde. So you are either in originally grown on methanol as a carbon source or succinct as a carbon source and then tested for performance of formaldehyde. So why we are interested in this is because growth and methanol requires using formaldehyde as an intermediate. And in that case, your formaldehyde oxidation enzymes, concentration of those enzymes are almost tenfold higher than just on succinate. 
So we expected to see a difference, and which is what we find. So if, again, if we track number of viable cells as a function of formula concentration, the methanol figure is the same as the one I showed you before. For the succinate, we see a remarkably less tolerant population. But again, surprisingly, we see a large continuous variation. A large number of cells behave het heterogeneously, different from the most of the population. Most of the cells can't take any form of the head, whereas some rare cells can. And again, they're genetically identical. And the difference is not just in form of the head oxidation, as shown by rna -seq. So we have discovered an instance of epigenetic variation in tolerance to formaldehyde in methylobacterium. So variation has different phenotypes in a given environment. Is this phenotype heritable? Because that's what we need to fulfill our criteria. We find that it is heritable. So to test that, we do something like this. We start with a naive population which has never seen formaldehyde. We expose it to four millimolar formaldehyde, thus selecting for those rare tolerant subpopulations. And then we grow them on formaldehyde-free, stress-free media, just succinate for a different number of generations, either two generations, four generations, six generations, eight generations, 10 generations, or so on. And we ask what fraction of these cells remain tolerant after spending some time without the stressor. We see something like this, that tolerance is stably inherited for multiple generations, even in the absence of stress. So before exposure to stress, in this case, one in a million cells were tolerant to three millimoles formaldehyde. When you select for growth on formaldehyde, you select for that rare tolerant subpopulation, and everyone you get is tolerant. After four generations on succinate, we saw a slight decrease, only one in ten pop of one tenth of the population is tolerant. At this point, what we were expected to see a uh, exponential decrease like this, because the cells keep losing the enzymes and the protein keeps getting diluted. But surprisingly, we see that the fraction of cells which were tolerant stabilized around 10% with time. So why is this the case? So next, what we do, what I do is I take populations from say four generations on succinate, regrow them on methanol. Again, no formaldehyde around. And surprisingly, we see that the population bounces back and they, all of the cells recover their tolerance. And all of the 100% of the population is now tolerant to formaldehyde, even though it spent four generations and six generations, 10 generations away from distress. So I repeat this for all these instances and growing that up on given number of generations on succinate and then transferring to methanol and see if all of them bounce back to retain their, regain their tolerance. And we see that that is the case. Once exposed and selected for, the tolerant phenotype is stably maintained. And this slight decrease on succinate and not on methanol is probably just explained by formaldehyde oxidation. When you grow on methanol, you have your formaldehyde oxidation genes turned on, and hence you're ever so slightly better at dealing with formaldehyde than when on succinate, but you still retain your tolerant phenotype without stress on each environment. So cycling back to our original question, uh, sorry. So we kept this going for almost 90 generations on just succinate, and then we checked what fraction of the cells are still tolerant. And surprisingly, we saw that populations remember their tolerance to formaldehyde even after 90 generations on succinate without any selection on formaldehyde. We are currently sequencing these populations to confirm that even after this time scale, they are genetically identical to the ancestor. So I talked about how we can have genetic solutions to formaldehyde, but initial growth is driven by rare tolerant phenotypes, which are epigenetically different, but genetically identical. So how do these two solutions compare to each other? You have a mutant loss of function in EFGA. And what we see is that the mutant is slightly more fit than the tolerant wild type. And both of them are much, much more fit than the sensitive wild type, which just dies. So cycling back to our original thought, can epigenetic variation influence evolution? So we needed a few things. We needed phenotypic variation. 
In this system, we have phenotypic variation and tolerance to formaldehyde. We need the alternate phenotypes to have strong fitness differences. And we see that the tolerant phenotype is performs much better than the sensitive phenotype. And we need a stable long-term inheritance of the two phenotypes, even in the absence of stress. And again, we see stable long-term inheritance in the absence of selection to formaldehyde. So given we have all the ingredients we wanted, how does ablation play out with epigenetic differences playing a major role? We have two parts here. A, can we demonstrate that you can have evolution driven by purely epigenetic variation and what do the dynamics look like? So before going into experiment, let's rewind and talk about how we typically study adaptation to a stressful environment. So when exposed to a stressful environment, so suppose you're starting from a given genotype, you have a genetic space and initially population start from a given genotype. When exposed to selection, the population travels the genetic space looking for more fit beneficial mutants and more fit genotypes which improve their fitness. They find one which corresponds to a different phenotype, higher fitness, and that genotype is selected for. And what we end up seeing is something like this. With time, fitness keeps on increasing as with the Lensky experiments. So what do the dynamics of adaptation look like? Something like this. So you have a large number of lineages initially, most of which are genetically identical. When exposed to stress, some of the rare beneficial alleles, they begin to increase in frequency and one of them takes over. And since they increase in frequency and take over the population, fitness increases. So if we were to sequence the population and use the frequencies of different genotypes comprising the population, they would serve as a proxy for which lineages are winning. And lineage success are typically driven by beneficial mutants coming up. But in the case where you have heritable epigenetic variation and not genetic differences, which are initially driving evolution, what would we expect to see? So we could have a case where you have the same genotype in the same identical environment, but producing alternate phenotypes and those two alternate phenotypes corresponding to different fitnesses. And since it's stably inherited, these phenotypes can be differentially selected for. So if we can track the frequency of each lineage in the population, we would expect to see something like this. A large number of lineages initially and exposure to some stress, some rare or tolerant lineages would survive better, they would begin to take over and increase in frequency. And again, we would see fitness versus time, something of this sort. But if we were to sequence the population and look at genotype frequencies, we would see something like this. No change in genotype frequencies in the population and the genetic sequence remains identical, which is something of a dilemma because typically lineage dynamics are tracked using genetic dynamic, genotype dynamics but in this case, we can't do that since the genotype doesn't change. But we see, we expect to see a very large difference in lineage success between lineages. So, how can we observe this without using genotypes as a proxy? We use something called DNA barcodes. So what are DNA barcodes? They are very short and completely random pieces of DNA. So in our case, they are like 20 bits long and completely randomized. So sequences of this fashion. And we have a pool of DNA barcodes on a plasmid and we insert them into our bacteria. So what we end up generating is a pool of bacteria and all of them are genetically identical to each other with the exception of one random neutral piece of barcode. So each barcode basically serves as a name tag. So if you identify the barcode, we can identify you came from this lineage and you have a different lineage history to everyone else which has a different barcode. So how can this help us track lineage dynamics? So what we can do is we have an evolving population. We can take that, we can sequence the frequencies of different barcodes at different points in time as the population is evolving. And barcode frequencies will correspond to the frequency of a particular lineage in the population. 
since all cells with a given barcode started from the same original cell which acquired that barcode initially. So coming back to our system, what we are interested in is evolution on formaldehyde and how epigenetic variation can play a role on that. So how can it play a role? If we evolve populations from formaldehyde, it has a couple of different trajectories to follow. It can switch to its alternate phenotype tolerant and grow on formaldehyde, or it can acquire a beneficial mutation and use that to increase its fitness. And both of them come with some pros and cons. The tolerant phenotype, even it's genetically identical, hence it's more accessible and the rate of switching and one in 10,000 of the population was tolerant to formaldehyde, whereas beneficial mutations are much more rare, one in 10 billion end up acquiring a beneficial mutation. Alternately, the tolerant phenotypes were slightly less fit, whereas the mutant was more fit, and epigenetic variation is less stable than a genetic change. So given these possible trajectories, how does adaptation play out? We have two hypotheses in this regard. The first is we expect to see differential lineage success without genetic change. So if you were to track individual lineage dynamics of each lineage in the population with time, you would see some lineages to succeed over others without the change since mutants are very rare initially. The second thing we are interested in is what do the dynamics of adaptation look like? So the experiment is as follows. We have a barcoded pool of methylobacteria. We evolved them on methanol plus formaldehyde as our environment for 40 generations. And we track the frequencies of each barcode in the population after every transfer. So what do we see? We see a soft sweep of few lineages. So what do I mean by that? At transfer zero, what I mean here is in our original pool, we have around 20,000 unique barcodes in our population, each corresponding to one lineage. When we allow them to grow on formaldehyde for the first time, and they grow for about 20 generations, and after the end of these 20 generations, we see only around 300 lineages surviving. So from 20,000, at least 20,000 unique lineages, the lineage diversity shrunk down to 300 very rapidly. And each color here rest corresponds to a unique barcode, and the light greens one here correspond to a number of barcodes which are very rare, since I can't show 20,350 here. But the take-home point is, we, as expected, we saw a differential selection for different lineages. Now the question is, is this explained by genetic change? That is, you had all of these surviving lineages were mutants, and we would see a few mutants taking over, or is it driven by epigenetic variation? So we whole genome sequence these populations before and after growth on formaldehyde, and we see that most of these surviving lineages are identical to the ancestor. So we had 20,000 lineages initially. This shrunk down to 350 because these 350 were selected for, but most of these 350 were genetically identical to the ones which lost. So here we have mutant frequency with time. Initially, we have no detectable mutants in our population. After one round of growth on formulae, we have 20% of the population coming up as mutants. So this is what we see, a small fraction mutants, whereas largely most of the population which survived was due to epigenetic differences for 20 generations. And we think that these mutants were pre-existing in the population and in our library, barcode library, because of the large number of generations the library had to go through to be made. So now we kept this going for 20 more generations, and we asked, what do the dynamics look like now? So we see competition between tolerant and mutant lineages. This is how it plays out. So on the top here, we have number of lineages surviving. X-axis here is time, Y-axis is frequency of each barcode. Each color, again, corresponds to a unique lineage. And we see that some lineages keep sweeping through the population, and the genetic diversity keeps going down. And whole genome sequencing the population, we see something like this. Very few mutants initially, very few mutations after 20 generations of formulae, but continued growth. 
the mutants start taking over. But surprisingly, the, but surprisingly, they do so much slower than would be expected without epigenetic inheritance. So if the population comprised of only sensitive cells and no tolerance, and we had a pre-existing mutation, we would see dynamics of this sort, very rapid takeover within a few generations. And here, even after 40 generations, despite how fit they are, because with respect to most of the wild type population, they have still not been able to get fixed. We did this experiment with three replicates. This was what we saw. This was the data I showed you. The other two replicates looked like this. Again, each color corresponds to a unique barcode. And what we see is that some, the same colors repeat across replicates. So for instance, dark blue here, which said, and these dark blue frequencies also track well with mutant frequencies, which leads us to hypothesize that these mutants only showed up because they were pre-existing in the pool and not de novo in our experiment. So we find that evolution formalized, at least initially, was largely driven by heritable epigenetic variation. Our expectation was to observe something of this sort. You have millions of lineages. When exposed to formaldehyde, some tolerant lineages would take over and they would allow the population to persist long term and thus evolve. What we saw was something similar, at least initially. We have thousands of lineages. A very small fraction of them were able to survive and take over, and most of them were genetically identical to the ones which lost. And these lineage dynamics the initial ones can't be explained purely by mutant success. So where are we going ahead with this? So we are interested in a couple of things. One is evolution with smaller populations on formula head so that we can weed out pre-existing mutations and see how de novo evolution takes place, both genetic and epigenetic. A second thing is if you have the possibility of long-term epigenetic inheritance and you can have a genotype producing alternate phenotypes, and alternate fitnesses. How does this affect your evolvability and genetic trajectories if you start with a population which can switch epigenetically or a mutant population? Can these two lead to different adaptive paths being followed up in your genetic landscape? We are also interested in better understanding what's the mechanism of tolerance and inheritance, tolerance to formula head and inheritance of the phenotype. For that, we are doing sequencing methylome of these populations using RNA-seq to understand what helps them remember and regulating the differentially expressed genes we find. Thank you. All right, great talk. Thank you so much, Akshad. Um, Really appreciate it. Is that RNA seq something to do with what the RC uh, Lewontin will will uh, contribute, or is something, no. something different? Yeah, that is. I wrote that mostly along the track of evolvability of and how historical contingency can affect your adaptive path. Cool, cool. Just wondering. Yeah. Um. So I hope everyone enjoyed uh, that talk as much as I did. Um. Uh, if anyone would like to have any questions, uh, you can type them in the chat or turn your video or uh, uh, microphone on. So uh, you can also raise your hand as Deepa has done here. So we'll we'll start out with uh, Deepa. Hi, um, hi, Aksha. Uh, really interesting work. I was curious uh, what happens without any selection in your last um, last part of your talk. Do you have that? Because um, I'd expect that there would also be some lineage loss just by drift. Yes. Uh, hi, Deepa. Nice to talk to you again. Great question. Um, we do have the data. I haven't shown it here. So we evolved them just on methanol, the barcoded pool, for the same number of generations. And we saw very little lineage loss due to drift. So we started with 20,000 detectable lineages. We ended up with around... 14,000 or so by the end of the experiment. I and see. even and even that we feel was just due to a lack of sequencing depth for those populations, since we mostly focused on these ones. So very little lineage loss on that time scale, at least. Got it. OK, thanks. Thanks.
All right, many people are clapping in the in the chat here. Um, uh, I had a question about uh, part two, where you said that the bacteria can remember, quote unquote, for ninety uh, generations. Yeah, is that because you ran it through ninety generations and you just concluded, okay, they can remember, or did something happen at ninety generations? Uh let's see. Can I go back? Yeah, so here I showed you data for how they remember for 10 generations, keep transferring for a few generations. So this kept on going for 90 generations, growth on just succinate without selection on formaldehyde. And after 90 generations, we checked, hey, can you still grow on formaldehyde better than the live wild type? And they could. If that answers the question, yeah. So you so you use ninety generations as a check. It wasn't like ninety generations was the maximum amount that it could could go up to. Oh yeah, we would just use that as a check. I see. Right. So there's no reason why a hundred wouldn't also work then. Yeah, potentially. Mm. Yeah, it most probably would work. Mm. I have a question. Yes. Hi, Shavash. Hi, Ashkat, how are you? So uh, what we observed was that um, the initial distribution of the methylobacterium on succinate, after removing the tolerance, uh, sorry, the formaldehyde stress uh, was shifted toward the low tolerance one. And this is something that we modeled with advection term in the model. But what you showed me is that actually after generations of not being um, exposed to the formaldehyde stress, still it keeps that tolerance level. So that was very interesting <laughs> in contrast to what I, at least we observed. Do you know what's going on there? Do we know? No. Can we Is throw it, darts? Uh, yes. Yeah, 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 okay. So we think that this initial loss which you modeled is just due to the formaldehyde oxidation enzymes getting diluted out. So after one generation, you lost half your enzymes. After two, you lost four. Well, four. You, your enzymes became one fourth of what you had and so on. And you reached your steady state succinate level. But some phenotype which helped you gain tolerance, that still remains switched on. So the tolerance distributions we see are a combination of both formulate oxidation and tolerance to formulate as a stressor. So you lose the oxidation part of it, but you keep the stress response part of it turned on and hence they stay switched on. So tolerance is more or less a discrete trait, not a continuous one. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the question. All right, and uh, Jessica Lee has a question in the chat. She says, uh, awesome talk. Uh, and her question is, uh, you mentioned that the loss of lineage diversity on formaldehyde is much slower than you would expect it to be if epigenetics weren't competing with genetic mutations. How do you predict how fast lineage diversity loss would be without the competition by epigenetics? That's a great question. I would like to know as well. Yeah. Okay. So the question is, this, where is my mouse? This is the loss of lineage diversity we see. In the case where you had only a sensitive wild type population, no possibility of tolerance via epigenetic change and a mutant, the sensitive wild type would not grow in the presence of formula, it would just die, and the mutant would take over. So it depends on how long you were suspended on formula and the death rate of sensitive wild type and growth rate of the mutant. You have the mutant increasing in number and the wild type dying out. So if the formula is continuous and persists, the only outcome is after one round of growth, the mutant will be the only surviving lineage in the population. Right, so you could if that makes sense. I think you could open the chat or, or I don't, I'm not sure if you can see the chat while you uh, while you uh, have the screen share. 
Um, but I believe, and Jessica can comment if I'm wrong, I believe the question is how was the dashed line estimated? Is that correct? This dashed line is not quantitative, it's qualitative. Right. What, I, I don't want to mischaracterize the question, but okay, she says got it. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, okay. So, and then uh, we will end uh, on on a question from uh, another question from Deepa here in the in the uh, chat. Um, in the simulations, you assumed completely independent modes of tolerance versus genetic mutation. Could these evolve? Could these involve similar pathways? For example, one might expect for formaldehyde. In other words, could genotype B still be able to retain the tolerance modeled in genotype A? Does that make sense? It does. Oh, great question. Mm -hmm. One of the key things we have to debate over. So the question is, there's some mechanism by which sensitive cells become tolerant, and there's some mechanism by which they gain resistance, per se. Are the two mechanisms independent, or are they different, or are they the same, if I understand it correctly? So in the model, we assume they are the same mechanism. So if you get tolerant and then you acquire a beneficial mutation, your phenotype is just the phenotype of this mutant, nothing to do with your epigenetic state you had previously. But we could totally imagine a scenario where the two are different. So you can have a beneficial mutant coming up, as well as some epigenetic variation in that genotype, which can lead to more complex, interesting dynamics. Why this was done? This model is just a preliminary one, and this is just for convenience, easiest to model. No biological reason it can't be dependent on each other. Okay. All right, and we'll do uh, we'll do one more. So, so, sorry to go over time here. We'll do one more quickly um, from Deepa. In the last part of the talk, you expect tolerance to be there uh, in each lineage. Why do only few survive? Maybe this should lead to different lineages taking over in different replicates for the tolerance part. You expect tolerance to survive there in each lineage. Why do? Yes. So different things you should take over in the epigenetic path. Uh, I'm sorry for slacking, cycling like this. I oh, know people have questions about all the different parts, so it's all good. Okay, so yeah. the green region here, the black region here, and the pink region here are the epigenetic paths. So the question is, are the lineages which survive here the same or are they different? Why do only a few survive? Only a few survive because we think only very few lineages are able to transition to the alternate phenotype across all populations. Hence, and most of them don't and the sensitive phenotype dies hence the loss of lineage diversity. And in the epigenetic path, yes, the lineages which survive are very different. So different set of barcodes here, different barcodes here, and different barcodes here. So they were not common, if that answers your question. All right, I think we are good. Uh, thank you, Akshat, so much for a fantastic talk and for kicking off the series here, for being the first one, um, and uh, for sticking a few minutes over time. Uh, so we will re uh, regroup here in a week on Monday at noon for the next uh, Greg seminar series. And we just thank Akshat for doing a great job to lead us off here. Thank you so much. I will see you all next week. Thank you for organizing. Great. Thanks, Ak Akshat. We will post the recording when we get it. Thank you. Bye, guys.